I, I'm especially glad to be here because I have been associated with NAS, the National Association of Scholars, uh, in multiple capacities for many, many years as a board member, and at the Inst Independent Institute for decades uh, uh, as an author and senior fellow. So it's a, I'm glad to be here today. There's two terms uh, from late 20th century politics that are somewhat relevant in discussing fake science in America. Uh, from the film of uh, In the Year of America's Bicentenary, All the President's Men, the phrase, follow the money, came into widespread uh, usage. Then 16 years later, Bill Clinton's top aide, James Carville, exhorted, it's the economy, stupid. And I was reminded of all this uh, recently when the eminent chemist Charles Liber, chair of the chemistry department at Harvard, was charged with violating American law relating to a secret deal he made with Chinese for providing them scientific prowess in exchange for $50,000 a month and an extremely generous expense allowance. What is involved here is not fake science. Indeed, no doubt very good science, but stolen science nonetheless. Does the Ten Commandments apply to the scientific community? Five other thoughts uh, came to mind when I contemplated uh, speaking on this topic. First, by the way, I do a lot of expert witness testimony, and now I'm, gonna, I'm not going to sleep tonight thinking about some of the things <laughs> uh, 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 five other thoughts. First, it occurred to me that in the natural sciences, the key to success is determined by the ability of others to precisely replicate your results. Imitation is the sincerest and most profitable form of flattery. Duplicating what others have done confirms discoveries, no doubt strengthening the case for patents and royalties, not to mention academic tenure uh, associated with them. It enhances employability and future market income for those authoring papers. My second thought was that in some regards, this is precisely the opposite to how success is determined in much of the rest of academia, especially in the humanities and the, social, uh, and the fine arts. Discovery of something new is important, as in the natural sciences, but in the humanities and the fine arts, uniqueness is important. Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa is worth, no doubt, at least a billion dollars. There are artists who can paint extremely good imitations of da Vinci's work, and they may fetch $1,000 or maybe even $50,000 in the marketplace. But even the latter uh, figure is a small fraction of 1% of what the original is worth. In literature, replication of someone else's work is called plagiarism. In the natural science, it is verification and confirmation of discovery. But in both domains, being first with something, being the discoverer is important. The third uh, thought I had related to my own field of economics and probably to most of the other social sciences as well. As in the natural sciences, we treasure the ability to replicate the work of others. But because of changes in variables that are immutable in the physical sciences often, with a passage of time or place, we often find functional relationships have changed or newly important explanatory variables are now present. So precise replication is impossible. We don't have the same controlled environment of the natural scientists. That is why I think economists, which I profess to be from time to time, are often spectacularly wrong in their predictions. 
For example, I'll just give one example. At the beginning of 2009, the chair of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, Christina Romer, said that if the economic stimulus package recommended by the president were adopted, the unemployment rate would not go above 8%. She presumably uh, reached that conclusion based on past historical experience regarding economic stimulus efforts and unemployment. What happened? The unemployment rate not only went above 8%, it did so for 43 consecutive months, the longest spell of such high unemployment since the Great Depression. Forecasting errors like this are embarrassingly common. Don't buy a used car from an economist. <laughs> the forethought I had uh, is that old expression often heard in academic circles, publish or perish. And I think it's quite relevant to today's discussion. Indeed, that might be the three-word executive summary of my presentation. To get ahead in academia, you must disseminate results to a broader public through publication. The fifth thought I had is, as in the Middle Ages and early modern era, Today, many use science to allegedly demonstrate the validity of certain quasi-religious or ideological views. The significant differences in opinion about the extent of global warming and of human impact on that warming are relevant here. I see Mr. Michaels here, who, I'm who is the, the last word on this subject. The attempt to suppress the views of scientists deviating from the quasi-religious -re views of environmental zealots to me is reminiscent of the arrest of Galileo by the Roman Inquisition uh, nearly four centuries ago. Are we at the end of the Age of Enlightenment? Now let me turn briefly to the economics of modern science. Increasing one's demand for services leads to higher prices paid for them, bringing more compensation to the service provider. A second factor in compensation, of course, is quantity supplied. If providers of services are few and limited, compensation will be enhanced. But if there are lots of providers, compensation will be reduced. All of this is relevant, I think, for the current crisis over so-called fake science. People fake science because they perceive it is highly remunerative to do so. It often increases the demand for their services. Didn't you read Professor A's new paper in the Journal of Last Resort? A member of a faculty recruiting committee might say, he's applied for a job with us. We must interview him. But so apply is relevant also. The supply of scientists with advanced training many of them are, who are academics, has soared over time. According to the Digest of Educational Statistics, in the 1980-81 academic year, a total of 10,333 individuals received, the doctorate, received doctorate degrees in the STEM disciplines, specifically the natural sciences, mathematics, engineering, and computer science. Scientists receiving degrees that year, a large proportion working at universities, are mostly retiring about now. Some of them are no doubt in the audience. Most of them are individuals roughly 70 years of age. Now fast forward 36 years. Remember the number 10,333. Fast forward 36 years to those receiving doctoral degrees in the year 2016, 2017. Over, uh, the number of PhDs had nearly tripled to 28,547. Oversimplifying things a bit, we might conclude that 28,000 new PhD scientists are buying to replace the 10,000 retiring ones. To distinguish themselves, to get scarce appointments at good universities, more than ever, publications important, so incentives have increased to break the rules regarding standards of scientific conduct. And I would add also that uh, the rewards, fake science probably has increased because within academia, 
rewards for scientific success or potential success are growing faster than they are for rewards for other types of academic endeavors, which might be alternative employments for scientists. The payoff to having a publication in a prestigious scientific journal are potentially much greater than having one in, say, an academic journal of literary criticism. The federal government dangles research money in copious amounts for successful scientists, but very li little for clever and resourceful English philosophy, or dare I say, anthropology professors. Uh, additionally, knowledge about extraordinary research accomplishment in the sciences travels fast. Uh, often papers with pathbreaking research circulate even before formal publication. But knowledge about extraordinary accomplishment in the other main things that professors do, teaching, tends to be localized. Good teachers often succeed because of accomplishments in relatively confined classrooms, seminar rooms, and even faculty offices. The world does not know how good they are, so demand for their services is modest. Data from payscale.com suggests that undergraduates uh, uh, earning bachelor's degree in such STEM disciplines as engineering or computer science get jobs with beginning salaries at least in the 50 to well over $60,000 range these days, about 50% higher than graduates in the social sciences and humanities who typically take first jobs paying 40,000 or less. Those salary differences actually expand with graduate work. A full professor at an elite private school in the hard sciences very often makes well over $250,000 a year, a significant portion of which is summer pay from research grant. Uh, a professor of English literature, though, would probably who made 150,000 a year, 150 a year, is considered doing extremely well. Uh, so the salary premium for science work is very substantial, and that is at least partly because of grants for scientific research made by agencies like the Federal Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, Department of Defense. Uh, uh, are more than 100 times as large as grants for research and creative activity in the humanities and arts given by the much poorer funded National Endowment for the Arts or the National Endowment for the Humanities. The budget of those two organizations is combined less than 1% of the annual research funded annually by the NIH alone. As a consequence of all this, a key article published in a scientific journal is potentially much more valuable financially than one published in a literary journal or more valuable than other demonstrations of artistic expression such as composition of an original piece of music. Articles in key journals are part of the ritual required of new university scientists wanting grants and permanent employment. The incentives to cheat, to manufacture data, or fudge results are large, even if the potential risks associated with such dubious behavior are relatively high. Additionally, the ability of scientists to add importantly to the stock of scientific knowledge in some disciplines may be reduced by the law of diminishing returns. Someone makes a fundamental advance in our understanding of some aspect of life on Earth, and for a few years, others can make some refinements to the initial advance worthy of recognition. But at some point, there is little more that can be added regarding that narrow science, uh, line of scientific inquiry, perhaps enhancing the tendencies of researchers to want to exaggerate, fabricate findings in order to get professional recognition. There's a broader vicious cycle at work. In order to get added prestige, perhaps in order to get admitted to the Association of American Universities, the elite club of 65 American schools considered our premier research institutions, many universities have expanded their PhD programs to gain recognition as doctoral institutions. Producing newly minted PhDs helps 
uh, improve their institutional reputation, uh, reputation. Not, only, not only that, improves the research pro uh, prowess of other universities where the new PhDs become employed. So the number of PhDs has exploded, growing faster than necessary to meet the demand for new scientists. As a consequence, we have PhDs, even in some of the STEM disciplines, who are underemployed, spending longer time getting their degrees. Uh, the average in the uh, English literature area, I think it's between eight and nine years now. Uh, uh, why bother get a degree? You're, not, you're gonna work at Wendy's anyway when you get it. Uh, uh, so it takes increasingly, so now we have increasingly long postdoc fellowships to delay the time when they, they need to become full-fledged members of the academy. To break out of this academic purgatory and into acceptable permanent employment, scientists are increasingly attempted to break norms of appropriate uh, scientific behavior. An academic recession of significant severity and unprecedented length set in shortly after the 2008 financial crisis. That recession has not truly ended at many institutions and in some places borders on full-fledged academic depression. Enrollments in American universities are lower today than they were a decade ago. The ability of universities to fund postdocs and hire new tenured professors has sharply declined. Historically low birth rates reduce the chances that this trend will reverse anytime soon. Academics, including even university presidents, I think forget how dependent they are, their institutions are, for public, on public support. Polling data are very clear that public support of higher education has declined materially in recent years, and I think a very important reason is for this is that Americans are fed up with, as much of the, with much of the nonsensical but political correct bloviating of, um, by American professors and fashionably woke students, a left-oriented press loves to feature in its coverage of the collegiate scene. As I near my conclusion, I remind you that universities started in the late Middle Ages. Perhaps it's appropriate sometimes to compare a university to a medieval manor, complete with its lords, also known as university presidents, uh, uh, knights, also known as senior faculty and top bureaucrats under the president, and serfs, the academic underclass of adjunct faculty and graduate students aspiring to entrance to the higher medieval orders. It's harder than, say, a decade ago to become a knight, an honorable member of the community, rather than an academic serf. The adjuncts who work tenuously at universities for nominal amounts of money, little prestige, and no job security. No doubt other factors may be playing a role in the rise of fake science. There's been a general decline in honesty as relative moralism tends to increasingly prevail over moral absolutes as declining church attendance perhaps helps illustrate. And I have, uh, we, could, we could talk more, I've downplayed the role in my remarks about the modern leftist ideology in shaping the debate over climate change and global warming, how this has led some to run, ride roughshod over accepted long, long accepted norms of scientific uh, uh, contact. We'll hear more about that. Where are Isaac Newton and Francis Bacon when we need them? Someone put a sign up, said I have two minutes. I have tenure. <laughs> I'll do any damn thing I want. No. <laughs> uh, I will be done. So indeed, indeed, as indicated earlier, the law of diminishing returns is relevant, and it applies here as well. Whether I've imparted any wisdom or legitimate food for thought for this wonderful gathering is perhaps debatable, but at least I am staying within my time limits uh, that our hosts have imposed. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>